so yeah i mean this is it's kind of a, a weird chapter in the sense that like um he's talking about doing like um you know basic models and then like we fit like um, a bayesian you know function right so the first thing just to kind of point out is like um um the prediction i mean anytime we're trying to do some kind of um, you know regression model we're um can you turn your sound down a little bit ron like i can hear your oh i'm sorry i'm just taking bit. notes no worries no worries um yeah no i uh i was like uh what is that noise um so then there's two basic things that we can sort of do with models and at this stage we can do prediction which is knowing you know kind of what we know about by the way first of all before i forget can everyone see my my r screen yes ron you can see my yeah. screen okay good i'm just checking just checking Sorry. Um, so if we want to try to predict some outcome, given what we know about one or more predictors, we also might want to, you know, we'll, we'll talk about this idea of comparison. So in, in, in implicitly in whenever we do models with different predictors, you know, it's, it's important to realize it's not so much about just sort of like thinking about within subject, but more about thinking between subjects compared, you know, one person to another, if we're, if we're dealing with people, I should say, in our in our model. Um, I'm not going to render this right now because I, I started out doing this, but I kind of ran out of time. But one of the things that R does that's pretty cool is you, know, you can do these like, um, actually, I can just do Visual Studio. But yeah, you can you can make really pretty. Um, you'll see how like I had the syntax before, but now it's showing up as this like, you know, pretty, you know, that's the syntax. And and now it, it, it renders like in LaTeX, I guess. I don't know if anyone, Ron probably knows about this because that's his background but um yeah so this is the classic you know um, yeah it's, it's pretty neat to take yeah. notes and yeah i think it's quite fast to type it's not annoying once you, you get, get used to it. it yeah when you get the hang of it yeah it's yeah annoying. yeah i mean you, you just have to kind of like learn the, the syntax of you know the little back scratchy or the back slashy thing and then you know then alpha and bar epsilon and actually i was wondering like um i've never heard of var epsilon so there's apparently like yeah, so I guess I guess there's like something for variable epsilon versus like you know the capital epsilon or whatever. But anyway, so yeah, this is like so much of everything we do is based on this formulation. I mean, like from Get that tattooed on your arm, maybe. I know, seriously. <laughs> like I've made you know our, our entire life livelihood and you know, you know reason reason for being is like encapsulated in this form. It's like the this is like the e equals m c squared of being a data scientist, right? Um, so yeah, we call obviously a, you know alpha and beta a, or, or a and b sometimes referred to as. Um, by the way, I, I don't know if uh, Alma, this is sort of I don't know if you're familiar with this, but typically when we refer to formulas using Greek letters, we're doing the formula in what's called a population kind of or, or like a parameters format. We're saying like at the at the population level, there's some intercept and there's some slope that we if we if we could figure out what that is, we could predict you know any given um why right any given outcome um given certain assumptions being made right so sometimes these are referred to as coefficients or parameter estimates or i don't know what anything else i'm missing or any other cool titles um but um yeah so anyway um today you know we're and i think next week is we're, we're just gonna be doing what's called simple regression which just basically means at most we're gonna have one predictor so we're using one predictor um you know, to predict some outcome. Um, unsurprisingly, probably going to do it pretty, you know, in, in, in real life examples, we're going to do a um, pretty bad job of, you know, predicting some unknown outcome um, given just one, you know, um, particular predictor, All, unless that predictor itself is, you know, super, super um, good at predicting the outcome, which, you know, may or may not be the case. So, um, by the way, this, this, I guess you could say the broad formulation or the, the broad title for this formula is often referred to not as regression, but as the general linear model. So, um, you'll see this a lot with like, you know, data scientists, instead of saying this is, you know, I used regression, linear regression, or, you know, you know, they'll just make a reference to the general linear model, which means it could mean a lot of things, right? It, it could mean linear regression. It could mean um you know other types of regressions and in fact they they go through in the beginning of the chapter talking about what what other things that we can do to make this 
GLM, as, as it's often referred to, uh, more more flexible and, and meaningful. We can add multiple predictors, which is something we'll get into like in a week or two when we get into you know, that. And that's, of course, important because what we want to do is be able to say, controlling for you know a bunch of other variables, the effects of some, a bunch of other variables, we found that the effect of X on Y was this, right? Without doing that, without controlling for those other variables, potentially, we, we, we we're not really sure if that relationship between x and y is what it is i mean we, we need to do more work to kind of parse it apart um we can also do non-linear models so models where you know the relationship isn't necessarily linear we can also include interactions which i'm sure we'll get to but basically interactions are just another way of saying you know the effect of one or more variables is you know contingent on the values of another predictor um stuff like that um another important sort of general terminology is something called generalized linear models which um basically is like the glm that i just mentioned but it's typically referred to when outcomes are not normally distributed which you know is something like you know a dichotomous outcome like logistic regression or poisson which we'll get into or negative binomial or anything that's just not normally distributed right they also mention this idea of um, non-parametric models, which, you know, I'll be frank, this is probably the one, one of the things I'm less sort of experienced with, but, um, you know, basically we're just, it's a, it's a model where we're not making kind of uh, the same assumptions about underlying distributions. We're just, we're, a lot, we're, we're, we're coming up with parameters, but we're not necessarily making the same assumptions. Um, one thing that I am actually very um, familiar with or relatively familiar with and, and interested in is this idea of what are called multi-level or mixed effects models. I think, by the way, Amma, some of the stuff that you're interested in, I think, where maybe you're, uh, I, mean, I mean, I think you had mentioned something about being interested in like Twitter stuff over time. Yes, yes. time. So uh, yeah, that was, yeah. I would, I would, I would, know, I would yeah. But you know now because of how I, I did get my data, but then just as I was going to get a new batch, Twitter hmm. got swamped up with the Elon Musk thing. And oh, it's like, yeah. How well, can I even trust Twitter data now? But well, I, probably, I do I, have, yeah, have some data. I just don't really know what to do with it yet. <laughs> we should talk. We should talk about that. Yeah, actually, I can. Maybe I can help. We can. We can help you at some point. That's that might be like a but, good little, little project for but us. That, that, that's, that's the thing. Like, if I already have the data and I'm going to think about what I'm going to do, isn't that like? the garden of fucking data already <laughs> no no not at all no you're not making any crazy i mean you're just basically saying well i mean first of all there's i would i would not try well we can talk about it more later but i would not worry about the elon era twitter data but um yeah, yeah. but anyway the point i was trying to make originally is that mixed effects are what are called multi-level models there's this is the, remember we in the bayesian stuff we talked about hierarchical models right so hierarchical models is another way of saying multi-level or, or and, and mixed effects is, is sort of a, another way of saying that too, where you're saying there's different levels of data. So we, we often talk about students nested within classrooms, nested within schools, nested within districts. That's a classic multi-level one. Or it could be something where, um, you know, where we have, you know, multiple tests done by the same person over time, right? That's now we have, you know, we have test um, examples done um, um, with, you know, they're, they're nested within individuals, right? And then also this idea of measurement error models. So this is models where we have predictors, we have outcomes, but we're also cognizant of the idea that whatever those X and Y variables rep represent, they're not perfectly um, create, you know, they're not perfectly measured. So if we can incorporate some you know, indices of me of error measurement, we, we get a lot kind of more certain about what's going on, right? So we'll, this is a common thing in like, in say, um, structural equation modeling, confirmatory, you know, factor analysis, if anyone's familiar with those types of things. So um, they started out with like, a simple walkthrough, which is weird because I don't know if you saw thought this was weird, Ron, but we're using like a stand function um, to do like a simple linear regression. I was kind of like, why don't we just use the LM function? But whatever. I just yeah, like, he, he's like, he never uses LM. He's like, I'm, yeah. like in the beginning, he says that I'm never going to use LM or GLM. Yeah. I'm just going to go straight. I, I forgot. Yeah. I had forgot. I had forgotten that actually. Yeah. In the very first chapter, he mentions this and he says using stand as if as if it's a general purpose fitting tool yeah um, 
And yeah. he gives reasons for it back in chapter one, one of them being that it does give you these uh, posterior draws to, to do additional uh, work with. So I guess it ties into his simulation uh, point of view, right? I just realized something. I just screwed something up actually in my little thing because I was just I was just rereading. I just okay. So I instead of using the example that he, I just used the first example in the exercises. That way, I thought it'd be more kind of like fun. It'd be something new. So we, we yeah, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna fit a model just using all of his syntax, just kind of you know fixing stuff. So I, I think I did this right, but just to double check. Okay, so we have a class of fifty students. So n equals fifty here. We give them a midterm with possible scores of zero to fifty. Um, which I've done here and a final exam with possible scores of zero to 100, which um, I'm specifying, I think here. Um, yeah. Although. Uh, well, X, you have X equals one. Oh, right, 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 right. Well, the uh, link, the, the yeah. Well, I think in it, the, in the table part, yeah, you have x equals one is to, uh, colon. Oh, zero, oh zero. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes, yeah. yes, sorry, sorry. Yes, I see your point. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's my bad. Oh, but I want this to be 50, right? Because it's, yeah, because that is indeed what the range of scores can be. So, um, right. Oh, why is this? For some reason this is hold on this is one of the problems with doing this in in visual studio yeah isn't the range of scores supposed to be 100 or is 50 well okay so this is maybe and i don't know Ron, if you if you if I, you see what i'm missing here but okay so we're saying that the the um the, the midterm oh, okay so midterm is 50 and final is 100 yeah that's that's exactly yeah and so um the thing I don't really get is okay. So in the R norm um, function, we're saying okay, the mean is zero and the sigma is is sigma point five points. Um, well, anyway, let me just kind of work through what I got, and then we'll, we'll we can talk about it some more here. So, all right. So now we have um, we have our intercept, and we have our um, uh you know the effects of of our x you know value um which in this case is our midterm score right so um ron can i ask you to be a, uh, the classroom nerd and interpret what this value that so the x is a midterm test scores and y is our final um scores uh what's what is the um how, how do we interpret the effect of x on um why in english i should say well it looks like i mean every additional point that they scored on the midterm tended to get on average an additional point on the final uh, right point one nine but yeah did you uh, i'm surprised at the the extent of that though because i guess did you just you just fit the exact uh what they said right y equals you just you produce fake data using y equals 30 plus 1.2 but mm -hmm. then why is the intercept 0.36? Yeah, see, this is the part that I, I don't, I guess what I don't know. Is, okay, so I'm, I'm specifying like. A equals, where's A? You didn't set A anywhere. That's the problem. Oh, <gasps> wait a minute. You just set A equal 30 up here before you do the simulation. You got B. Oh, no. Boy, oh boy. My bad. Because I wonder if that would give it that the, the coefficient is not significant. I wonder, I don't know. Hmm. Nope. Still very significant. <laughs> yeah. Why is it so such a small error on that? Well, here's the thing I don't get is like so. We're, I mean, like, is there a way in R norm to specify the the, the min and the max? Oh, you put sigma equal point five though. It should be point um, sigma was ten, right? No, because well, I thought right, right. So um, uh, sketch by. I thought it was, is it? Residual standard deviation 10. So sigma <sighs> should be 10. Oh, standard. man, I really screwed this. I really screwed this up. And yeah, you can truncate it, but you don't have to bother. It hopefully won't go out of range. <laughs> mm -hmm. Let's see. So why is that? Now you're fitting it. 
Sorry. So the, the sigma 10, what does that represent? That is the residual um, error. Uh, error. Okay. So did they give that in the question okay. or, or you chose any like, cause you were simulating data, right? Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So let me actually find the original question. Um, sorry. I'm. On what I find surprising is that in the light of what he talks about later about regression to the mean that that doesn't come into this somehow, right? <laughs> yeah. So, um, hold on. Yeah, you're right. I totally screwed this up from like the other thing. So yeah, the, the residual is, um, the residual standard error is um, 10. So, um, okay. And yeah. did you put okay. the, the B of 1.2? Okay, yes. Yes, yes. I did. I did do that. Um, and then, um, oh, okay. somehow this got clipped a little bit. That's weird. Yeah. I've noticed this with quartz. I don't know if anyone else has met, 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 um, dealt with this, but a lot of the uh, like quarto stuff, it's just, I don't know, it's a little buggy. Yeah, thing. so it's like, I, I still use R Markdown because like it works. <laughs> mm -hmm. Me too, yeah. day two. I gotta get back to doing quarto, but. Yeah, so anyway, this is what the figure looks that like. Lady. Yeah, so this is, um. so just to be clear, I, I mean, this is all sort of, you know, psych one or stats 101. This is all, you know, all of these dots are actual co combinations of X and Y values. And the lines are, the combination of ex of existing x values that we found, which is between zero and fifty, and the and the predicted values given what we know about x and the relationship between x and y. That's the only thing that we're actually using to construct this, right? Um, and then here's our equation. Now, um, entirely, it's entirely possible this is still wrong. So interpret with care based on you know. I think I said. <laughs> I that think I said right. I think I set this up right, but let's let's you know, let's be careful. Um, okay, yeah. So one of the things I thought was actually most interesting, and I think this is one of the things that he does that's so good, which is this like sort of discussion of things really? like, yeah. So this idea of thinking about regression as a comparison, right? So what's this is a very tempting thing, and especially I don't know if Ron, you can speak to this, but like when you work in business, business people love these types of models because it's like this panacea oh if i just give you a whole piece of information you can predict something else for me and you know i can feel really confident you know a 95 percent confidence that um whatever is happening um yeah so um this needs to be 10 okay so yeah by the way um um just so you understand ama so the residual standard deviation is that is the is how is, is basically um actually is is the difference between these dots and the line you see this so like the, the space between these dots and the line that's that residual that that, that sigma that we're talking about does that make sense okay so because is it like an average sigma or basically yeah so basically we're taking like we're, we're sort of we're, we're figuring out a way to aggregate all of the differences because you know if you think about it i mean it's um it's not perfectly symmetrical right but um the idea is, is you know, some of these the, these big negative ones are going to get, you know, uh, mostly kind of over, you know, um, kind of balanced out with the positive ones, and you know, a lot of these are by the lines. But th all we, we really care about is how big are these deviations from the line. That's what we talk about when we talk about sigma. And um, when we say that the sigma, the you know, is um, equal to ten as we do here what we're saying is is that uh, test scores will be within 10 points of the linear predictor which is in this case the midterm score um about 68 percent of the of of the uh, for for about 68 percent of the data points which is basically like one um, standard deviation away from the mean and then it will be 20 points pardon me still haven't fixed that entirely um um of the linear predictor approximately 95 percent of the time so basically you know maybe i'm not sure how useful a predictor within 20 points of a test score that only ranges you know between zero and 100 20 points isn't very precise but you get the point here we can actually do some kind of um figuring of like you know you know how certain can we be that you know whatever test you know predictor 
um, estimate that we have, you know, how, how, how certain are we that it's going to be, you know, within a certain range of values. Another thing they, they bring up, which I, I don't think we get into very much now, but we will um, get into it later, is um, this idea, you know, this idea of R squared. Are you familiar with that, Ama? Maybe? Yes, I am okay. familiar with the R script. Okay, yeah. no, the, no, the R squared, the idea of R squared, the calculating R squared for a model. Yes, I'm familiar okay. oh. with the R, calculating okay. R squared, yeah. Okay, okay, that was, that was, yeah. So basically all we're doing is we're saying one minus um, the ratio between this residual standard deviation and um, the variance, or excuse me, the squared residual. So basically the, the, the residual variance um, and versus the variance around Y itself, right? So Y itself has a bunch of natural variation, right? Which is contributing to some of the variation that we see in our predicted scores, right? Um, and so what we're trying to do is we're trying to say, is this ratio, you know, um, is it, you know, more of this, which is, you know, this is noise, right? This is this means we're not doing the, the top part of the, the, the ratio is, is noise. We're not doing a good job of predicting here, right? This is so if this is um, really big relative to that, we're not going to be doing, you know, a great job or, you know, a predicting, um, um, you know, R squared. So what is R squared? R squared is just, you know, there's a lot of different d debates about it, but basically what it is is um some kind of an index of how well the model is explaining the variance between um x and y and then and then trying to predict y does that make sense so in this case we have a very it's a pretty high r squared so if we were to take um if we were to square that let's see we get 0.58. So basically like 58% of the variance related to the final score is um, related to um, the midterm score, if that makes sense. So yeah, this this has its own set so, of problems. I'm sorry. So you had 0 0.76. Uh-huh. And how did you get the 58 from the 0 0.76? Sure. I will show you right here. Just square it. That's it. Okay, so you square again the R squared. Yeah, well, yeah, R squared is yeah, it's it's yeah, because we're squaring the the standard deviations, but then yeah, we're we have to square the actual overall ratio itself. And and that would mean what like. Well, we're basically, like I said, we're basically, so we're basically saying that 58% of the variance um, in Y is being predicted by its relationship with X. Does that make sense? Okay, so it means that the first one you calculated was R, not R squared. I'm, I just... No, 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 no. This you know, it's, it's you just you just um, you square R squared to get the percentage of variance explained. That's that's all that this is called. So R squared. Oh, okay. Yeah. So this is just another way of saying this is just saying like this is um, um, this is just another way of saying you know the square of R squared is the percentage of variance explained in the model, basically. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. 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 Yeah, no, it's it's hard to explain sometimes. Um, so um, one of the other, couple other quotes I thought were, were interesting is, you know, we have to be careful not to overinterpret a fitted model, which I, you know, kind of spoke to with, you know, this is something we deal with a lot in the industry, right? Where people want to kind of take a model and try to do too many things, right? And in fact, one of the things he talks about is, you know, think more about a comparison. One of the, I think this is actually is one of the most fundamental things that most average people don't understand about research. I think a lot of normal, quote unquote, civilians think research is 
figuring out like what the the right answer is or what the optimal answer or whatever the you know the optimized answer is but oftentimes we can't really do that because all we really do in research is compare things right we compare one treatment to another we compare you know um one set of variables to another as predictors it's so i think that's a really important thing so he makes this mention of you know the, i think in the um the actual example in the book it was the effects of gender or sex on you know earnings and um so i think the effect of sex was like some value and you know but it's it's it doesn't really in in that case it doesn't really matter unless we kind of say okay well first of all um which which gender group is the referent right and like you know and what does it really mean so instead of thinking about it as like the overall effect of sex was x think about what it means it means that compared to males females are doing you know this or that or the other thing if that makes sense so um yeah any questions about that anyway I, I think that's that's really important right it's 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 we never really get to like sort of absolute truth but we get to comparative truth with you know it's still super meaningful um a lot of the times so um that was it i you know um they go into the history of regression which you know i guess francis galton who was this british um you know father of of um well, he invented the um, a lot of sort of statistical practices and a lot of famous sort of um, statistical kind of like thought experiments. And um, he's the guy that kind of thought of like this idea of like wisdom of the crowd. I don't know if you're familiar with that idea. Like, you know, if you give a thousand people, if you show like a bull, you know, to a thousand people who can just look at it and they ask them to come up with its um, weight just based on the look alone, you'll get to a pretty good answer just by aggregating the distribution of responses, right? That was the kind of a famous thing that Galton found, which is this idea that, you know, individuals are not always very bright, but if you give enough people enough information, they together become collectively pretty wise, right? And so one of the, um, you know, this is, he, he sometimes is referred to, you know, like this was referred to as like the wisdom of the crowds or, or whatever. I don't know if people are familiar with that idea, but, um, one of the things he's also sort of famous for finding out about is this idea of regression to the mean, which basically is, you know, something where um, you, you know, it, it became, this was through his work and others that we found that like, if you had a super tall parent um, who was way above, you know, the mean, it's, you have a real shot of their offspring being shorter, right? Because if, the, you know, you have a seven foot tall parent, um, you know they're already really outside away from the mean and so just by random processes of of draws like you know if we were just to randomly sort of do some kind of a draw on um you know a distribution we probably get a smaller number and we see this a lot we have you know i, I, Wait, I, I two it, tall parents have an average height kid or like a tall and a short giving average we're just talking about one parent for now. We're not. You're not. We're not I think you're trying to get okay. into like. I think you're trying to get into like Mendelian sort of like. Um, okay. you, you know. So like, this but, is just one parent who is tall yeah. has a likelihood to have an uh, average. Yeah. High. Oh. Yeah, and not for any. And that's one of the things that they talk about, right? Which is, um, it's this isn't for causal reasons. It's, there isn't anything causal, and in fact, they they give this point about like saying you know, oh, if like, uh, there, there could be like this, you could find regression to the mean in our test taking thing. And so, you know, if you had a student at the midterm get like a 98%, and then they got like a, you know, a 89%, you, you might be tempted to say, oh, well, they just tried less hard on the final, right? Because that's what we, we found, right? No, I mean, what, we, what may have happened, and we, I'm not saying we can rule this out definitively, uh, one way or the other, is that, you know, it may be that that 98% on that first midterm test was just, you know, you, you were, you, you were to use a, a American football term, you were out kicking your coverage, you know, you were you were doing more than you're probably capable of. And um, you kind of came back to earth, right? This, I don't know if anyone's, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm going to use some Americanisms here, but um, I, I don't want to like be too just, you know, like kind of, but like baseball is a classic example of this, right? So, you know, the first month of the season, you know, somebody starts out really freshman hot. slump. Yeah, or no, not not even the freshman slump. Just like you know, some guy who, who always hits three hundred, he comes out in the first month and he's just hitting two forty, and oh, okay, and, the, yeah. and the people and people say that's okay, it's okay. He's a lifetime, you know, 
320 hitter or whatever. So regression to the mean is is going to happen. So that's important, right? So regression to the mean isn't just about getting worse. I think that's what a lot, a lot of people think. A lot of people think regression to the means, you know, you start high and you go lower. It could also mean going higher, right? So if you're a lifetime 300 hitter and you're hitting 180 for like a month, regression to the mean would mean going, you know, hitting better. Does that make sense? So the mean is just like kind of what is stable and what is typical, right? And this, mm-hmm. you know, we, and we and we all see this in our own lives, right? Like, you know, maybe you're like not a great runner, but uh, which I am not, you know, and but you train really hard and you do a bunch of stuff and you, you your times get all better and, you know, and then, you know, as time goes on, though, it, maybe it's just really going to be hard for you to maintain those things. You know, there's like kind of a, a regression to like there's a mean within your performance that just kind of tends to happen. That's unfortunate, but it is sort of, it is what it is. Um, so, yeah, so I like some of the quotes here. This, this idea of the paradox of regression to the mean. Regression to the mean thus will always arise in some form whenever predictions are imperfect in a stable environment. That's that's pretty bad. I like, I mean, pretty badass. I like that um, way he says that. Um, so the imperfection of prediction induces variation and regression to point prediction is required in order to keep the total variation constant. Um, the point is that a naive interpretation would lead you in, in for an effect um, that is entirely spurious, right? So that's, yeah, just once again, just to note that it's um, it's not about there being a reason for that regression to the mean. It's just, I a, see. it's a statistical artifact. That's what, that's what, that's what he's trying to convince us. And that could be the case in the, the example, right? Although we, the model there specifically, you know, we put in by hand the right. dependence of one on the other. Right. How do, you, how do you actually model that? I don't even know. Which one? Which, what are you, which one are you talking about? Sorry. How do you model? Like, how do you take into account this possibility of regression to the mean? Is there a way to model it in some way? I don't know. Yeah, it's a good question. <laughs> um, I don't. I don't think so. Maybe there is. I don't know. I have, I've never really dealt with it myself, to be honest. But um, his basically in the book here, he just says it's just a cautionary tale. Be careful comparing like with like, right? So you can't comparing. A student on a midterm to a student on a final is something you shouldn't do, I guess. You right. Try yeah. To predict from the, I mean, but you do want to be able to do stuff like that. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. By the way, um, just uh, by the way, as a psychologist, I have to prop ah. my people. Prop my peoples. This is a famous example. One of the the, the the real famous people in the history of what's called behavioral economics is um got two guys, uh, Amos Versky and Dan Daniel Kahneman. Um, Amos Versky died in 1996, but. Daniel Kahneman won the Nobel Prize in Economics uh, in 2003. I, I I know this because we don't get a lot of Nobel Prizes as psychologists, so we remember them. Dang it, <laughs> <laughs> we uh, we uh, we we don't have a ton. So anyway, um, the the whole gist of their um, research was finding out that a lot of people made assumptions about, um, you know, their um, about about regression to the mean, right? And so. You know this the the idea is is you know that a lot of things people think about isn't really probabilistic you know there's there's a lot of interesting kind of things that we do mistake you know we make mistakes in terms of not realizing you know, how how things like sample size and you know what the your base rate is or what your baseline's performance is so um yeah. So anyway, I think um, I, I like this. So so it's like you know our point here is not to the simple analysis will allow us to perform. Rather, we're demonstrating regression mean along with comparisons can lead to incorrect. So it's just it's really it's not really about a procedure. To, to your point, Ron, I think it's more about this idea of um, just being aware that you know you right. may be you may be finding things or not finding things because of this statistical property, right? It may be that um, you know that's the 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 first test score was just a real aberration and and you you have no way of fully ever teasing that apart unless you have other test scores you know so if you had other test scores and you can find out hey this this midterm score was not really representative of that person's real work that you could probably include ah i see you could probably include that as a as a covariate and then you know if you find that the the you know the effects if that if that seriously removes the effects for you know the midterm i mean you, right. have, to, you have to deal with you know co- um, co- collinearity but yeah okay, cool yeah i mean I, just that, that first ex- the exercise you pointed out 6.1 which i actually didn't do but i looked mm-hmm. at that and i said that's kind of weird because actually that's the kind of case where you should be very careful right because it's yeah. a midterm and a final situation we just did that right? so 
Well, right. And also, let's, let's be fair. Like, okay, so like, if we were actually doing that study, let, let's just say that that's our, our scientific question, right? What yeah. else would we want to know? I mean, this is this is more foreshadowing for like next week, which I think next week is multiple re regression. Yes. Um, no, I think next week is single. Oh, is it? Okay. Oh, sorry. The just... detail about how to do all this yeah. stuff. Oh, right? okay. So yeah. So yeah. I'll, I haven't I'll... actually read it yet. I guess I'm planning yeah. that, aren't I? No, I, yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's right. Um, but anyway, the, the you know the point is is we would want to know about like okay, how long did they study? You know, um, you know what like you know how what's their what's their hit grade history with this topic? Okay, you know, you know what I mean? Like yeah. so we we want to and and you know there's probably some effect for things like gender and for age and or, or actually maybe if they're all in the same classroom that doesn't really matter. But th there's all kinds of things that might be predictive of you know your final score. So you would want to have more of those things if they're meaningful that is because that's the only way for us to really to tease apart um, yeah you know what the what what effect is of what so to speak so that is cool all i got um oops so Good job. thank you even though you've been thank sick you did a great so job much. yeah uh, well this this is a lot easier for me to talk about than uh, Ama. So we're, yeah. we're in this this advanced R group that where we do all these like programming stuff. It's like it's out there on the on the the edge of my knowledge. Let's put it that way. So yeah, this is um, more in my wheelhouse. But um, yeah. So um, anything else? Nope. I will so, guess I'll see you guys next week.